Hi, my name is Sue Sullivan. I teach uh, math and a little bit of coding at Perkins School for the Blind. And I'm here today to tell you a little bit about um, coding and how you can do with your students, different programs you can use, and also how you can jump in and, and learn it. Um, I put my email address here. If down the line you have any um, questions to ask, I'd be happy to help you at any point. Uh, so a few years ago, I was at a POSB conference, a STEM conference for students with, uh, for teachers with the visual impairments, uh, for teachers of the visual impairment, students with visual impairments. And I saw that some students across the country were teaching their students coding, and I became really interested and decided to jump in. And beyond that, I saw that coding was popping up in a lot of places for our um, students, um, you know, just every day all over the place. And so I thought it was something that if other students are being exposed to that our students should also have access to it. It's a really exciting time to try coding with students because it's um, so much is exploding for students with visual impairments. There are more and more accessible products every year I find and people are being really creative on how to teach, which is fun. Um, I do find that I can teach pretty much anyone with a little bit of curiosity how to, how to do some level of coding, and um, it's really fun. The students have been having a really great time with it. So I'll teach you a little bit about it today. Um, today, you'll be, you're, we're going to have a quick presentation on the benefits of teaching coding to your students. Uh, I'm going to walk you through some different programs that I have used and specifically focus on snap circuits. CodeQuest, a Spiro Bolt, Apple Swift Playgrounds, and then I'm going to also introduce a couple other, um, just quickly go through a couple of the programs that I have heard of or I'm kind of interested in or have tried a little bit. And during this presentation, I'm going to show you how you can learn to use these programs um, and also different ways of adapting them for your students, depending on if they're low vision or if they're a Braille user. And I just really encourage you to kind of jump right in and try it and don't be afraid to learn with your students. I mean, that's what I, that's what I did is I just was very honest that I haven't done a lot of coding before and we had fun kind of figuring it out together. So don't by any means feel like you need to be an expert in order to try this. So why teach coding um, to your students? It's a real world, real world way to teach mathematical thinking. Um, there's a lot of computational thinking in um, coding. It's also like the process of taking a big project or a big idea and breaking it down into smaller steps, which I think is really great for our students in so many different areas of their life. Um, it encourages growth mindset because there's a lot of perseverance that comes through when your program first doesn't work and you go back and try it again and need to fix it. Um, some of our programs have a lot of math skills in it where you're dealing with angles that, that um, or measurement, uh, variables, conditional um, statements, a lot of spatial organizations where you're figuring out directionality, right, left, up, down, and how far. Um, students come up with different techniques for solving problems. And like I keep saying, and I will keep saying this, the students really have a fun time with it. Um, I'm going to show you programs and you'll see examples of all of these benefits that come out with students, but also, you know, there is a sense of teamwork and um, the courage to try something new and jumping in and building self confidence um, by just tr even trying coding. So let's let's get started. Um, the first one I wanted to talk to you about was snap circuits. This really is teaching pre-coding skills, and you may have seen these before. They're made by a company called Elenco, and there's many, many different kits, but you can just start with the Snap Circuits Junior one just to um, to show your students what it's about. I find these a lot at like our swap shop at the dump or in yard sales. You can buy them through APH, and if you go to the website to buy them off of the, the um, website, it's about $20 for this kit at, on like an Amazon website. And you'll see, you can see from the box a little bit that a lot of the pieces really are tactile. So they don't require a lot of braille adaptation. You really could use it right out of the box. Um, and it's a great first step for a student who's interested in coding because it's teaching them how to follow a list of steps to get a desired result. And also it's tactile and hands-on, which is fun for our students. And so what happens is you're building a loop where a circuit goes through when you turn a switch on and either a bell will ring, a fan will spin, or a light will turn on. And so those are all things that our students can, um, you know, you can switch out the fan for the light if you need to, but it's something that the students can, can feel or hear the, the end result. 
Um, and so the other thing I wanted to mention was you don't have to teach like a whole coding class. You can just incorporate this into a class on a free Friday activities. It's something that you could use during an indoor recess or in an after school activity um, just to have the students try it. I use this with students who are in third and fourth grade kind of math level, older students, but who are learning that kind of level of mathematics. And the box says ages eight and up. So that just gives you a sense on the age light range of who this would be good for. And um, what I find is there's some students that you may end up giving more support to and some students who may end up being more independent. So you can kind of judge how much support you give depending on your student and their abilities. And I would say you need really no training on this, but APH does have a lot of videos that you could watch if you're interested in um, checking it out. And so this is what happens when you open the box. These are the pieces that are laid out. Um, you can see there's some switches, a fan, um, a noisemaker, uh, and then there's this grid board. The grid board's marked A through E, F, maybe F, and it goes across numbered, and I put braille labels down the side. Um, but there's, it's pretty easy for the students to feel the difference on them, and um, there's not a lot of pieces to work with when you're working with the junior set. If you open up the direction book, you'll see that there's these um, directions that you can read to your student, like project number five. It, um, or what we did is we, we wrote them up in um, a Word doc that we can put into large print for our students or else into Braille so that students can read it themselves. And so what I found was in the beginning, I would read the directions to my students. And um, as they got more familiar with SNAP circuits, they would start to read it to themselves. And so um, this is just the beginning of the directions where the project is a lamp and fan and the objective to show how a lamp can indicate when a fan is running. And it tells you that the pieces that are needed, there's a total of eight pieces that you need to do this project. So these are just some adaptations I made to help my students. One is putting a non-skid mat underneath the um, grid, because otherwise the grid is, is just, as you're trying to put the pieces on, it can move around a lot. You can see how I put braille labels down the side for the letters. I found the numbers, they would just end up counting going across. So like B1, you know, they would go to row B and hit the first one, or B2, go over two. So the numbers didn't weren't necessary. I also took an APH. Um, sorting bin and I sorted in the beginning, I would take the pieces and sort them into the bin for the students so that they would have fewer things to um, sort through. But then as time goes on, they would sort themselves. Um, putting the pieces on the grid takes some fine motor skills and something that my stu your students may need help with, mine did. It's like a little tricky to snap them on depending on their, their strength. Um, and then, like I said, you either read the steps to the student or the students can read them alone, depending on what where their level is. So, and I would find you can do one of these easily in an hour, like in a one class, one class time period. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little video of what, what this looks like. So it's just fun to see a finished project. Product, uh, project. You can see it only has a handful of pieces. It was easily done in an hour, um, but yet there's a lot of reading of a grid and snapping them on in the right order in order to make it work. And in the end, it's really exciting when they flick the switch to see if it's actually gonna work or not. Oops, let me see if I can get to the next one. Ah, and so these are some of the thoughts that my students had about working with SNAP circuits and some of the skills that they gained. Um, I actually did this just yesterday with one class and the student, um, you know, she said, she said, I felt so proud of myself for building it and cleaning it up. Um, they, you're building a love of STEM because it's using so many different, you have science, but then mathematical concepts, um, you know, weaved in. And I love the fact that it's a tactile or, you know, physical, um, class that you're doing that the kids get to touch and move things. Um, they're following a list of steps to get a desired outcome. And as I spoke to, they're, you know, reading this grid of A1, B1, C1, which you know 
it will be helpful as they start to read a coordinate um, plane in, geom in, um, in algebra and math. Um, uh, they're practicing their fine motor skills or working on them, their problem solving skills. If you do let a student make an error, which I really encourage you to do, and it doesn't work, going back and finding the problem is a really great skill for students to work on and having the patience to work on it. And then they have a huge sense of pride and accomplishment when they actually get it to work. I mean, it's a big thrill when you flick the switch and the fan goes on because <laughs> you never know until you do it. And I just wanted to show you, there's a new product that just came out from APH called Snappino. Oh, my picture's right over the name of it. And what it is, is um, it's using a coding language called Arduino in order to build um, programs. And I haven't tried it yet, but to me, it's like the next level, or it's a different way of having a more advanced student use these snap circuits. So it's something you might be interested in. So I hope you think about giving it a try. So that was my first um, program that I wanted to show you. This one is um, another one, it's completely different. Um, it's again, it's pre-coding skills. The students aren't actually using code at this point, but it's a APH iPad app um, that's free called CodeQuest. And it's fully accessible, which is really exciting. Uh, I find this is a good precursor to a pro um, program that I'm going to show you a little later called Swift Playgrounds made by Apple. Um, and the way that our students use it, you'll see as I walk through it, is that there's an embossed Braille map that they can read, and then they can use voiceover on the iPad to access the app. Um, and it's super easy. Any of us, any, anyone can just open the app and give it a try. There's a help menu on the app. But beyond that, you don't really need um, any training in this. And this is something that maybe I just weave into an, a math class in order for students to have some fun on a Friday or something. So I think there's so many math skills in all of these, um, all of these uh, programs. So this is what it looked like. I just wanted to show you that there's five levels, five different planets that the students work their way through. And on each planet, there's six levels. It's very quick to finish a level for, for the beginning ones. And then depending on your student's orientation of space and things, um, some of them might get a little more complex, but it's really all just using the same basic four arrows to move up, down, right, and left, and then maybe to blast a wall as they get more advanced. So there's not a lot of moving, not a lot of um, different things to learn. So I'm going to show you a little bit about it. Um, on the right-hand side is what you see in the app. So there's a little green um astronaut and there's the red spaceship and you're supposed to move the astronaut to the spaceship and i'm going to show you um, a video of this in a minute but you just follow the the light gray walls are unbreakable walls and so you have to follow the dark gray path and what the students see is they get this um, braille map that you get for free off the aph website and what i did is i helped my student by putting borders around the edges with foam strips and then I also put a tactile marker for the astronaut and a tactile marker for the spaceship. And as my student solved the puzzle, I would move, you know, she said move one right, I would move the astronaut one right on the tactile map so she could see what was happening. It's like that, that orange little crinkly paper. So that's just, like I said, it's a free embossed maps. So you can also send these embossed maps home with your students and it might be an activity that they can work on on the weekends once they get more independent with it. Okay, and I'm just going to play you a short video of how this works with a voiceover so you can have, um, you can see how the program works. There's, like I told you, there's just the four directionality buttons. There's a delete button, a clear all, um, a button that reads the directions, a help button, and a play button. So there's not a lot of things. I kind of feel like this is a really great way for students to start to learn voiceover or have beginner voiceover skills because it's not um, complex.
So that was one of the levels. It's level four of the first planet. But again, they don't get overly complex. I feel like it's just different variations of the same puzzle. So it gives the students a lot of practice. And sometimes I have them, as they're gaining their skills, go back you like and redo levels so that now that they're um, in order to give them confidence and in order to have them maybe go back and do it with more independence. So looping back through them is also another thing you can do with it. Oops, let me see, hold on. Okay, so with this program, students get great practice with the tactile maps, which is something I think our students really benefit from and using voiceover. Um, they learn and reinforce directionality, right, left, up, and down. Uh, they're developing, practicing, listening to the auditory skills if they're using voiceover. They have, um, once again, their problem solving skills when the project does not work, like where did it go wrong and where to, how much do they have to delete. Students have a habit of deleting the whole code and starting all over. And so as they get more comfortable with the program, encouraging them to find where it went wrong and just deleting a part of their, their series of commands is great. And then they have a great sense of pride and accomplishment when they're done. Um, the student this week told me, I'm so proud of myself. I guess I was using my growth mindset during that one, which I, it's just really great when you hear students feeling confident and happy with their, with their lesson. So this one, um, the Sphero Bolt is the one that I actually saw Ed Summers um, present. He works at SAS. SAS, I don't know what the name of the, SAS is the name of the company, but he um, introduced this to some of his students and worked on a, actually he's not a teacher, but he's the one that I saw demoing this program. And what it is, is a small, this small ball that can roll around and it can change colors. And in order to make it accessible to our students without vision, if you put a cup on top of it, it makes it very auditory and you can hear the ball move. And so um, in mainstream school, students are using this a lot. There's so much you can do with it up through AP, AP computer science level coding, but I just stuck with the very beginner coding and had fun with it with my students. And I'm gonna show you some of the things that I did today. Um, what this is, is this is block coding. And block coding, what it is, is it's how we teach students, all students, um, how to code. It's the very beginning ways that younger students are allowed to learn coding language or enables them. Because instead of typing the word like move forward, move underscore forward, semicolon, they move the whole block that says move forward. And I'm going to show you this in a minute. And what it does is it prevents all the frustration that comes with the syntax of maybe spelling a word wrong or forgetting a comma or an underscore. So it allows especially our students to code much more quickly and be able to create much more complex programs very easily. This, uh, and then the, the actual coding is hidden behind these block codings that, that the students usually don't see or sometimes can click on to see what the coding looks like. Um, this costs about $150 and there's an app that helps it be accessible for our students made by SAS that is free. You use an iPad. Um, and this I use with students who were kind of learning fifth grade math and above. And I used it in a summer school program like once to twice a week in order to um, give the students an exposure to coding. And I'm gonna show you some of the projects that I did with them, they're really fun. Um, and honestly, I just started at a very beginner level of this and played with it with the students and kind of learned how to use it. Once you download the, the app, I think you'll get a sense of it. and then. I have not gotten very sophisticated with it, just as a, not yet at least. <laughs> Here is the Sphero EDU website, and this has all tons and tons of projects that are there for you to explore and to have fun with. Um, they can get a little bit more complex. So like I said, I just stuck with the very beginner and I made up my, um, my own kind of just very rudimentary projects. But also um, students with, you need vision to access all of these EDU websites, all these projects, or you need to make them accessible. So Code Snaps is what, um, what is, the, is the, the app that I use to make this accessible for our students. And it's, I'm gonna show you it up close, but you can see how on the right-hand side, I created these cards that I printed off from the website specifically for Sphero. 
And then you're supposed to be able to take a picture of it and it uploads the code into the SAS programming. I didn't find that to be really work that great, but I made the cards with the codes on it and my students without vision could build the commands like move forward however many meters, turn however many degrees, move forward, turn right, move forward. And then either a student with low vision or I would actually just move it into the um, into the, the app. And again, don't have fun, don't be afraid of it, just have fun with the kids. So this shows you on the SAS um, code snaps program, these are all the commands you're working with, which you can see is not a lot. It's a great way to introduce students. You can move forward, turn right, turn left. You can turn right a number of degrees, like turn right and turn left means 90 degrees. But if you wanna do more or less degrees, you can use the one that has the degrees command. The Sphero bolt can spin. You can have a set of color, random, rainbow, whatever you like. There's a wait command and there's a repeat command. So it does teach looping, which is kind of fun, but it's just really a beginner way to start learning. And all you do is you, with voice, it works with voiceover where you can double click or else you can drag the commands over. And it's, it's really, the students took to it right away. So one of the projects I did with my students that was just a very beginner thing and we had a lot of fun with was we talked about rectangles. We actually built a rectangle using some tactile objects and felt it. And then we went down to the auditorium and we tried to make the Sphero go in a rectangle. And I know it may sound easy, but <laughs> it took a little doing to figure out like how far forward do you wanna go? So we had measurements, how many meters? And then you're gonna turn how many degrees and in what direction? And then also like where the repeat went, like we had to learn how that worked in SAS programming in Sphero. And so that took a little bit of playing with, but you can see how we were able to make a square using pretty much five commands. And I have a video of this for you. Okay, here's the video. Um, one tip I have for you is to have a starting point because every time you run the commands, like if you're tweaking it a little bit, you wanna always start your you're going to see this with obstacle courses and stuff. You always want to start in the same place. So I found having a starting sheet really helps. <laughs> so it was fun. That's the time that we actually got it to work. You can hear how the cup made it really auditory for our students. And then we spread them out in a way that they can, they could see if their coding worked. And the light um, is really great for the students who are low vision because it makes it the, um, the ball really stand out. Um, here's another project I did. It was um, an obstacle course. And it, it, I just wanted to show you how it took a little trial and error. So like turn left 30 degrees, that's something that the students may try 45 degrees or 90 degrees and then be like, oh, that's the wrong direction. I have to make it smaller. How many meters to move forward they would have to play with. And what I suggest is that your students write just a couple lines of code, get that to work, and then write a couple more lines of code, get that to work and so forth and so on. But this is about as complex as I got with SphereVault um, doing these steps. And so here's another video. One day I had these bowling pins in my classroom, you know how you accumulate things. And so I brought them down to the gym one day and thought that we would um, set up an obstacle course. And my student looked at the bowling pins and said, oh my gosh, we're going bowling with a Sphero ball today, which I thought was a way cooler project. <laughs> so we set them up and she had to try to make the ball knock over the bowling pins. And it looks, you know, again, it looks so simplistic when you're doing it, but figuring out the number of degrees and the number of distance, and this is when you want to start the ball in the same exact spot every time. Um, it takes some playing around with, but that's also the fun part. Um, so here you go. So there you go. It's just another way, a fun idea. And you saw the code before about like the number of degrees and the distance. And that's about all, 
all it takes. So, um, and then this is my last one I wanted to show you. This was a project I think I saw on um, Pathways to Technology or something. Uh, and what this what they suggested doing was making the sphero go around something, um, go under something, and then knock something over. So I had three students. They each built one of these three. Um, parts to the, you know, physically built them. And then they had to code the code to make this happen. Um, the day I went to do this, the auditorium was being used. So I did it on a, a table. And what I did was I used this paper to mark where we put the obstacles because it took more than one class period. And that way I could put the obstacles back on the same spot when we came back to the program to finish it. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about what it looks like. So there you go. So that was just a, a fun project that we did. Again, it's something that I may introduce just a little bit here or there for students to get exposure to. It's not like it's a full class, but it's um, the, the students really have a lot of fun with it. And so I think I've spoken to a lot of these before, but I just want to keep reinforcing the things that happen when students do coding, that it's this gives them an introduction to block coding. It's them building a list of commands to get a desired outcome. Um, reinforcing the directionality. This one actually brings in angle measurements and distance measurements a lot. Like we did take a yardstick down with us when we did coding um, and measured things out. So they got a sense of how long a, yard, a meter is, I should say. Um, problem solving and pride and accomplishment. I mean, it's really fun when those pin, um, those bowling pins got knocked over. It was really fun because it took a lot of, um, trial and error to get her to actually doing it. And again, it's hands-on learning, getting the kids up and moving is, is so good for them, I feel like. So that's really fun too. It's fun to teach as much as they're having fun learning it. I find it really fun to teach. Um, and so I think this is the last one I'm gonna go into a lot of depth with, but it's Apple Swift Playgrounds. Um, Apple Swift is a coding language that people use to write apps. And Apple decided that there should be a way to teach students introduction to coding. And so using the same language, they created Swift Playgrounds for students. It is really fun. It's a little bit more advanced than the things that I've been showing you. Um, it's on an Apple, it's an Apple iPad app, it's free. And Apple was so fantastic. What they did is they created uh, Braille maps to go with the playgrounds, which I'll show you in a minute, so that it's accessible to students without vision. Um, the Braille maps are free. Um, and this, like I'm gonna tell you, it does get complex fast. It's teaching, teaching more advanced coding skills. I think it's like, I use it with my high school students, but the ones that are really interested in coding and, um, and that it's appropriate for. It's a self-paced curriculum. It has hints in it. If you, um, all the solutions are like on YouTube if you get stuck as a teacher. But what I did is I kind of went through, I did the levels on my own. And then as the students were doing them, I redid the levels on my own while they were doing it. And then we would compare um, how we solved it. Cause there's always multiple ways to solve these problems or solve these maps. So I'll show you a little bit about it. And this is just what Apple says about it. It's a revolutionary iPad app that makes learning Swift interactive and fun. It requires no coding knowledge. So it's perfect for students just starting out. Solve puzzles to master the basics using Swift, a powerful programming language created by Apple and used by the pros to build today's most popular apps. So again, this is block programming. So you don't have to write all the specific semicolons and underscores and open parentheses and things like that, but it allows them to learn how to do loops and conditionals and fun um, functions. And just the way it requires students not to have any coding language, I wanna encourage you that it requires you to have no coding language and you also can do this. And just to give you a sense of this, there's about 45 lessons or 45 puzzles to complete in the entire like Swift Playground curriculum. I find as you start getting into it, it can take a full class period to solve one puzzle if you're letting the students be really independent. Well, it really depends on the student, but um, it's a little bit more involved in time, time involved. 
So this is the very first level, just to show you what it looks like. You have this little character bite who's orange with a blue top of his head. Your job is to make him go forward and collect the gems. So you can see how they write it right out for you. Look for the gem in the puzzle world, enter the correct combination of move forward and collect gem commands, tap run my code. And literally down at the bottom is where you see collect gem and move forward. So a student would tap on move forward three times, collect gem once, hit run my code, and Byte would walk up to the gem and collect the and collect the um, and collect the gem. Um, students with low vision, I find that using the iPad, I tried a couple of different things, but using the iPad magnifier works best because um, then you can magnify the collect gem and the move forward at the bottom. Um, you can also hide. Well, I'm not gonna. You can hide the map or hide the code if you want to make it bigger. And then students without vision can use um, the tactile maps or and use voiceover. And so on the left hand side, you can download free maps to emboss, which I think it'll, you'll see in one of these slides, or else Lighthouse Media for the Blind has these beautiful low vision braille maps that you can purchase that cost about $200. Um, I find that my, the, braille, the braille maps have been working fine for my students and most low vision students don't want to use this um, map. They want to use the, the, the map on the um, iPad. And then a Jean Patron who works at Perkins School for the Blind came up with this great idea of building a Lego board of the puzzle and had the students walk through the Lego board um, to get a sense of what they were trying to accomplish which I thought was super fun, so I wanted to include it. Uh, here's a picture of a student using it, um, a CTV, but again, you're like controlling the iPad. It just didn't work that great. I would just encourage you to use a magnifier so you can learn from my mistake. <laughs> oh, and so this I wanted to show you was level nine. So you can see how it's starting to get complex from level one. And this one, what he has to do is he has to toggle the switch that's kind of towards the top. It's a gray box. He has to walk over there and turn this and toggle the switch on. And um, he can walk one of two ways. He can either walk forward and kind of turn around and go to the left-hand side of the puzzle, or he can go forward and go to that round, it's called a portal, pop up on the other side and toggle the switch. So that gives them some choices to make for the students. And you can see what the how much tactile graphics a student would need to read um, on the maps. Not only do you have the portals and the switches and bite and the obstacles, but you also have to read whether what level you're on. It starts on level zero or if you're on level one, because you can't just walk into a wall. You have to make sure that you're using stairs to walk from one level to another. So um, that's a little bit about that. And here's a student just using the tactile maps with his, the iPad open um, to add the code. I find this does involve a little bit more, the voiceover on this involves a little bit more um, skill. My students are using the router a lot um, to get from, if you have to type in function commands sometimes, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a higher level of, um, of skill. And this is the solution and kind of what it looks like just to give you a sense of what a student may type in. There's a function to turn right, what they teach you and they walk you through this is that um, in order to turn right, you have to make right bite turn left three times. And that's just a way of them teaching you functions at a very easy rudimentary way. And then they go, and then this is how the, the student solve the commands, solve the function. It, again, once again, he just goes to the bottom, he clicks on the one he wants and it populates in for him. So there's not, not a lot of typing um, that you have to do letter by letter. And I'm just gonna show you kind of what it sounds like to solve a function.
out. You can now use functions to create new abilities, to create new functions, give it a name and define it by giving a set of commands, then call the function to make it run. I find that they have really great directions throughout this program. It's self-paced, but then again, you can support the students depending on how much support they need, how much guidance they need, how much of an explanation, things like that. Um, I think it's um, really fun for our students because now you feel like you can see how you're getting more into coding with this one. Oops, we already did that. Okay, and then I just wanted to give you an example. This is like the 20th puzzle, just so you can have a sense of how complex it gets. Um, there's, I think about 45 puzzles. I don't know if I mentioned that. And this one's called Gem Farm. Um, so one of these I created, one my students created, but you can see how there's four commands used a lot more in one of them. Um, than the other, but both of them worked completely fine. And it is really fun at the end to kind of compare code and see um, how each one of you solved it. But when you're looking at it, the code is all move forward, turn right, toggle switch, collect gem. It's not a lot of different commands that you're working with, even though you're on like the 20th level. This is just a note I got from my student three hours after our class, like he emailed me and it just showed like the excitement that he had for Swift Playgrounds and in doing it. And it doesn't even really matter what it says. He's talking about um, why a character turned left three times, but I just thought it was so great that after he left my class, he was still thinking about the coding. So some of the things that you learn from Swift Playgrounds is that um, it's an introduction to block coding again. It's a way that students can do so much more so faster, so much faster because they have the block coding. Um, this, pro this program introduces more advanced coding skills such as functions, loops, and conditionals, among other things. Um, it builds a list of commands to get a desired outcome. We have directionality again. You heard north, south, east, west. You heard, you know, column two, row three, things like that. Um, it is more advanced voiceover skills that they're practicing, um, their auditory skills, their problem solving skills, and again, having a sense of pride and accomplishment. And I just want to reiterate, it's something that you can learn with the students. It's okay to get stuck. It's okay to say you don't know the answer. It's okay to look something up on YouTube and find out. Um, and that the students, I find a lot of students really took to this pretty naturally and were able to figure out a lot of things um, and teach me some ideas. Okay, so there was one other one. These I'm just gonna actually touch on really quickly. There's a couple other ideas that I have dabbled in a little bit, but I just wanted you to be aware that they're out there. This is an AP computer science course with Quorum. Quorum is a programming language that um, is built specifically for students with visual impairments or who are blind. And they incorporated a lot of things to make it easier for students who are blind to code. It may be like simpler, more straightforward language, um, things like that. There's also, Quorum has a whole bunch of different programs you can run. I did the AP computer science one, like at a, like a, not fully, but a partial level. There's also a whole robotics one that I really encourage you to, to look into if you're interested at all. Um, the website is quorumlanguage.com. This I taught um, one year, I taught compute, the AP computer science curriculum one day a week, and then I taught Swift Playgrounds one day a week. So the students had some coding and then some general computer science language in the same class. And um, the way I learned this is they have a code, they have a um, training over the summer every year. And I went out for a week and they're really an incredibly supportive community um, who will help you in any way they can to, to, to work with us with your students. And so that week of code, that week of um, training kind of, it was in Washington, Seattle that year. And they have grants and the, when, the program's free once that you, you can use it. But um, I just found, found that it was really, my kids really enjoyed this this um, information. And so just to show you a little bit, what they do is they take code.org, their code.org AP computer science principles class, and they made it accessible for our students. They took all the lessons and they may change the activity or they put it into a program that um, our students can use. And I'm gonna tell you about code.org in a minute. But um, 
you can see how you learn about the internet, you learn about digital information, intro to programming, big data and privacy and building apps. So just when you're talking about a computer science class, just a little part of it is programming. It's really about computers in general. And so if your students have any interest in that, I, there's lessons for every single lesson. There's a fully written up explanation of what to do. And you can just literally follow the lessons with your students. And again, this is about like IP addresses and how information gets moved around. And it's, it's really it's really interesting to work with, but it may be something for students who have an interest level beyond coding. And this is um, outside of the curriculum, Quorum has this hour of code activity that's very accessible and a great way to introduce your students to actually writing code. This is not bl block programming. I should have clarified that at the beginning, but this is an opportunity for students who are actually typing in code. So they need to have um, the ability to use a laptop for this one. And so there's a little video. Um, if you look up AP, if you look up Quorum Hour of Code, this is with Mary, they call it, it was the name of it. There's like seven different parts and she tells you what to type in and you can see type your code here at the bottom. I put in number pi equals 3.14159, number radius equals three, number area equals pi times radius times radius. And then it's supposed to say the area is and tell you the area and also write it. And you can see in the black box how it actually wrote out what the area is. And so it walks you through typing that, but students, um, it makes it very accessible in an entry level way for students to try coding. So you could open this up without knowing anything about anything and walk through it with your students and have some fun with it. It's a very easy way to show your students some coding. The other one I kind of wanted to talk to, um, it was about was code.org. This is one that I've used with um, two students who are low vision this year. It's a really excellent program, but it's very visually fatiguing. So it's something if you open, you can go to code.org, it's all free. You can open it up and you can see the lessons. This again, they're typing in code. So they're going to have to watch where they put their open braces and their back braces. It's learning HTML and CSS. Um, so two types of coding language that work together. Um, it's, it's really fun. It's very game oriented. It's written for middle school students, but I use it with some high school students. Um, and over the summer, I mean, over this past course of the year, they've learned some HTML and enough to make like their own website with pictures and fun fonts about something they're interested in. And so um, if you have a student that you feel like has low vision that would be interested in it, it's a great thing. Computer science, they have all different level programs that you can use. I did computer science discoveries. And again, over the summer, they had a, um, a one week long training on it that I took. And then throughout the year, they had training that you could attend. And there is a cost to it, but I got a scholarship and, and was able to, to go for free. Um, but it's just, it's a fun way to have students um, learn coding. And again, the lessons are all kind of self-directed and there's teacher answers. And so you can jump in and you can try this and, and, um, and learn with your students. The last one I wanted to show you about was Code Jumper. This is new from APH. Um, it's a great tool. And because of COVID last year, I didn't get a chance to use it because we were remote for most of the year. But it's something that I'm really looking forward to using next year. This was built for students at a, they say, K through fifth grade level. I'm going to use it with um, some students who are older, but kind of in that um, educational range. It's from APH. It costs $700 for the kit, but can be used with multiple students. And it, it gets used with either a Microsoft um, tablet or a laptop. And what was really impressive about this code jumper is they have, um, a, it's fully accessible, but they, and it's, it's hands-on learning. You can see by the things on the screen, there's knobs and there's dials to program, or you can use the screen. The lessons are phenomenal. Like they're really, they're teaching students, um, actually, let me show you. They're teaching students honest to goodness, like coding and computer science um, topics at a very introductory level. So you can see how they have sequence and algorithms, parameters, debugging, loops, counters, binary numbers, 
constants, all of these lessons, but again, at a K through five kind of um, level. So if you open up any of these, and I'm sorry, I apologize, I didn't take a screenshot of them, but it's really easy to follow the lessons. Everything is written out very clearly. You would need no coding knowledge to um, jump into this and to give it a try with your students. And so I'm just gonna show you a quick, here it is, like this is thread one, oh, a thread of these blue things connected at, at one portal. And it says play pig one time, play rooster one time, play cat one time. And so I'll show you what happens when the students actually do that. So th there you go. There, I know that may feel juvenile, which may work for some of your students, but also they have things like the piano and um, different sounds. It's not just animal sounds. So it's just the one I happened to, to show you. But you code it, you can code it using, again, using the actual knobs and switches, or you can code it on the, um, on the computer. But the other thing you can do is you could braille the code and have them put it on a magnetic board um to write the code so there's lots of different ways you can make this even more accessible for your students so that is my presentation i hope you've learned enjoyed learning a little about coding i'm so grateful that you took the time to watch this and maybe um, learn a little bit about different things you can do with your students there's lots of ways you can weave it in with your um it doesn't have to be like a full course it can just be after school it can be indoor recess for some of these like snap circuits it could be a sub plan um, and there's just, it's a lot of fun for both you and the students. I think you'll find that. And here's a quote I just wanted to read. Bill Gates says, learning to write programs stretches your mind, helps you think better and creates way of thinking about things that I, that I think is helpful in all domains. And that's really what I found is so many of the skills that the students were exposed to are really beneficial to them in so many ways. Thank you very much.